everybody, welcome back to the Goliath Gauntlet presented to you by Kayfabe Cards. I'm Tanning Grace, I'm joined with Mitch Leslie. Mitch, how are you doing today, buddy? Good, yeah, uh, fantastic. I think we had some uh, awesome games uh, yesterday. We got to sort of kick off this Goliath Gauntlet number two, and I think matches sort of really delivered. I'm super over the moon, like on a personal note, that like Hayden Dale's able to advance past the first round this time instead of getting absolutely brutalized uh, like he did <laughs> to Isaac Crute last time around. So. Our bracket's shaping up really well, Tannen, and today's game is, uh, it's an absolute banger, man. I am uh, beyond excited to be covering it. Yeah, I think uh, your excitement is going to be palpable through this entire match because this is one of your favorite matchups. I say favorite very loosely. I know this is one that keeps you up at night. But before we get into the exact matchup today, let's go ahead and take a look at that bracket and what went on uh, Friday in some of our matches. Yeah, so I we were blessed with that. A Kano versus Briar matchup sweat out of the gates, right? Historically... A very fast-paced matchup. A lot really depends on Kano getting his pieces uh, in time. Unfortunately, apparently, a 12th power command and conquer with go again is not good for Kano. And, uh, uh, you know, Peter, unfortunately, had to concede there to Hayden uh, as he got uh, the absolute stuffing beaten out of him. And then we got a rematch of our grand final talent. It was Margin Bay versus DM Armada. Really interesting game. A lot of intricacies. Hopefully, we're able to pick up on some of those. Margin Bay goes back-to-back -back in wins there in a matchup that's Typically pretty hard for Icelander, but I think we're starting to realize that the Ballander build has a little bit more game into what Dromai can do. I thought the, the list from DMI was really interesting. Uh, it was a Royal Dromai that didn't actually bring the crown in that particular matchup. Uh, and we saw that while it's great to have a lot of Arcane Barrier via your, via your dragons on the field, if you don't have the blues to power them, uh, they may as well be blank. So fantastic matchup that means that obviously margin bay advances to play the winner of brody spurlock and the tall timmy so yeah the heats keep on coming we got a lot of fun in store for goliath gauntlet watches tenant yeah speaking of fun that's in store let's go ahead and move on to what we got today in the matchup that i was alluding to that you're so excited about one of your favorite players joshua lau is going to be playing today versus Viet Pham. and this is a matchup that uh you've said before this kind of gives you nightmares sometimes kind of keeps you up at night we've got dorinthia versus icelander here today yeah, look, I think as a Dorinthia player right now, you need to understand uh, this matchup. You need to have at least some game into it. And I think that uh, a lot of Dorinthia players have gone back and forth on the best way to handle Icelander, especially now that, you know, Icelander brings in a lot of these uh, large attack action cards. Uh, Josh Lau is probably one of the most well-known Dorinthia players, but it's also for a reason. Um, you know, he, I think, was had like a top 64 finish at PT1, top 32 finish at, at Worlds. And this is on... Heroes that, especially at the time, were not considered to be remotely good. This is on Bolton, actually. So Sabres Bolton, something Josh really pioneered. Uh, very, very deep understanding of that particular matchup. But his Dorinthia, in my opinion, is is probably one of the best that, that I've ever seen. He's, he's also really on top of creating educational content, which is one of the reasons why he's so well known. And I think he has a big stake in Dorinthia actually being competitive because he's constantly trying to push the boundaries of what you can do with this particular hero. And he's going to have to do it today against Viet Pham, Tannen. Yeah, and it's gonna, we're gonna see if he's gonna be able to do that. I know you're gonna be, look, you're gonna try to be as neutral as you can in the booth. I know you're rooting for him just a little bit because you're a big Dorinthia fan yourself and play the hero he's quite a, Josh a bit. Josh fan, yeah. I, yeah no, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm rooting for Josh. I'll just put it out there. I have sure. no bones about it. And uh, his opponent this week, like you said, no no soft matchups here in the Goliath no. Gauntlet. Uh, this is a player that is the German national champion, at one point has multiple top eights and nationals, and was the number one seed going into the top eight, the elimination rounds at Worlds, playing this deck, playing Icelander at Worlds. So both of these players kind of playing the decks I would have expected them to, like if you asked me to guess what decks they would have registered here at the event, this is what I've guessed at. And Viet Pham, no slouch with Icelander whatsoever. Like I said, number one seed going to the top eight of Worlds. He's gonna be a tall task for the warrior player to get through it today. Yeah, I mean, this guy, uh, you know, he ends up going up against Michael Hamilton in, right. in that world's top eight and has an unfortunate uh, sort of match where he ends up arsling a, a sort of Ooh. a D reactor. And you were there, obviously, uh, that Hamilton actually is aware of. I think he had prior info, he was able to play around that. And obviously, yeah, Hamilton able to take that game away. He, to our understanding, basically brings card for card Michael Hamilton's list into that tournament. So he sort of sees this bull lander idea. He loves it straight away. He, he packs it uh, he packs it straight in. The guy is extremely international guy. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's like fluent Japanese as well. The yeah. guy is like really impressive. Uh, gets he's a around. renaissance man. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, exactly. So this matchup is going to be really exciting. Uh, I want to start talking about the deck list a little bit, if you don't mind. Let's start with Viet, uh, because again, this is one that, you know, we're probably seeing a fair bit of. There's a couple of tweaks here, which, which I kind of like. Uh, Viet actually has in the sideboard a couple of copies of Channel the Blink Expanse. 
which was an ice uh, aura that was brought in a, a little bit in the early days of Ice Lender. You know, prevents heroes from drawing cards, revealing cards, or searching decks from effects. That actually is a card that in this matchup can shut down things like Singing Steel Blade, a card right. that allows warrior players to sort of tutor. It also shuts down Steel Blade Supremacy, which allows you to draw on hit. Now, it's a little unwieldy to bring into play, much like Channel Lake Fridge, it requires you to be you know, sort of pitching ice cards to those flow counters. It does cost a little bit less. So I'm really curious if that's the kind of card you want to bring in here. I don't feel like Icelander has many bad matchups and that she should really tech specifically for Dorinthia. That's an option for VFM, and the rest of the deck talent, uh is something that we've talked about on the Goliath Gauntlet many times. Yeah, this is, looks pretty stock overall in the main, like what you're talking about. You know, you're looking at your, you know, your Aether Ice Veins, your attacks, you still got Wounded Bull, Scar for Scar, Fintel's Fighting Spirit, the kind of stuff we've come to learn and uh, expect in Icelander. Maybe not Icelander when it first came out. This looks a lot different, but ever since Michael Hamilton put that Bullender list on the map, this is kind of where they're at. Another card that I'm looking at in the sideboard here, you know, we see three blue brother in arms. Do you think that's a card that might come in this matchup just to kind of be able to like block enough or maybe even over block in anticipation of some of these uh, attack reactions? Yeah, look, it is helpful. The thing about Brothers in Arms is it's not a defense reaction. So, uh, you know, you cannot defend with it from Arsenal. It'll still trigger reprise effects for a Dorinthia player. So it's not nearly as, as valuable to you as like a Sink Below uh, is going to be in this matchup. But Icelander only packs the three Sink Belows. Normally Dory folds to heavy defense reactions. One of the reasons why she's doing so well lately is a lot of decks are taking a little bit more aggressively, especially the Guardians, sort of getting away from like 16 D reacts, going for like Frost Fangs, going for Pummels and stuff like that why she has a chance to shine here but this matchup is still very challenging for her because uh, Dorinthia still needs to deal with sort of that split damage a lot of physical damage comes in plus arcane and Dorinthia's equipment suite sort of prevents her from stacking arcane barrier three and in some senses Tannen you don't want to because if you're pitching right. your cards away to arcane barrier three you cannot really pressure your opponent Dorinthia needs uh, blues. She needs pretty heavy resources. There might be some hands you draw multiple blues, right? And you can sort of pitch to Arcane Barrier 3. But a lot of the time, it's going to shut down your game plan too much. So there's the element of racing in this matchup. Let's talk about Josh Lau's deck. Uh, this is pretty close to what I've experimented with uh, quite extensively. Uh, Josh packs one copy of the Oasis Respite in this deck. In this situation, it's very effective at shutting down off a Tunic counter, uh, providing there's no Channel Lake Frigid in play, uh, Aether Ice Fane, right? You have Arcane Barrier 1, and you can also Oasis Respite it. Um, so that's quite helpful a lot of the times, plus the life game element. Uh, there's three CNCs in this deck, kind of dead cards in this matchup, unless Icelander opts to sort of, uh, you know, put in Arsenal an attacking card, or I don't know if Viet Fan's putting too many red defense reactions in his Arsenal I don't anymore. think he'll ever, yeah, I don't think he'll ever do that again, yeah. Yeah, and in that case, it can be good, but, um, you know, I find that th that card can often come out in this kind of matchup. Iron Song Pride, new card from Dynasty, right? Very effective in, so if you can get a naked Dawnblade swing for three and they just don't respect it, don't block it because they don't want to trigger a reprise, you can actually play Iron Song Pride after that, and then you actually get a counter on your Dawnblade, even though you've only hit and attacked once that turn. That's a lot of fun. Cards like Route are really crucial. Josh has a signature card in this deck called Biting Blade. Uh, it's the kind of card that he really likes to play to mess up math with blocks. Most Dorinthia attack reactions go up by three. Biting Blade can go up by four uh, and then add plus one to the next attack. So it's a bit expensive. Uh, it's the same right. cost as a route, which you know generally gives you a stronger effect, but it's something that can be tutored up if you need a specific number to go over on your hits. So here's your deck list, Tannen. Very excited to see this matchup. It's going to be Josh Lau in a, in a matchup. He's very familiar with the Icelander. Going up against Viet Pham. He's going to have to try and hold off Dorinthia Iron Song as she looks to get those counters going. Let's jump into the game. The Goliath Gauntlet is brought to you by Kayfabe Cards, where reality and fantasy meet. Go to kayfabecards.com for all your Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, and Flesh and Blood needs. Kayfabe Cards. Be who you want to be. And here we go. The 36 life starting for Viet Pham here. <laughs> Josh Lau with a fantastic expression on his face. He's going to be hoping to... Uh, Put some real pressure down on his opponent here. Uh, and you'll notice the equipment suite is Arcane Barrier 1 and Final Spring Tunic for Dorinthia in this matchup. And it's going to be Viet Pham opening with a very powerful play. Aether Ice Vein. Josh Lau cannot block all this damage out. That is a red fuse Aether Ice Vein. Frustrating for Josh. Less in terms of card advantage, uh, more in terms of just, well, unless I have an, unless I have an Oasis Respite, I'm taking four damage. 
Yeah, we see a blizzard getting revealed here as well. Something that could possibly take Go again away from an attack later in this as, as the uh, ice reveal. Like you said, though, uh, you know, being turn one, not the end of the world for the card advantage part, but like just showing you one of the problems that Josh is going to have in this matchup where he can't exactly stop a ton of arcane damage if the situation like this comes up. You are racing against Icelander, although it's kind of hard to believe that. Uh, and, and that's why Ether Ice Fane's the only card that can sort of really disrupt your hand. Uh, and then there's like all the non-go again effects, all the effects that sort of deny your go again away. So Dorinthy Healer could do something really cheeky. Uh, if you have an Iron Song Pride in hand, you can actually play this now, get a free counter on your Dawnblade because it only disappears if you haven't hit on on your turn. Uh, well, so sometimes Dory likes to go second uh, just to sort of do that sometimes. But denying a, an, an arsenal away from the Icelander is normally preferred and... That's why you sort of uh, want to go first. Love that uh, sign, still braid supremacy map uh, with uh, Leas Lasahito, of course, out of Jakarta is the artist for Dorinthia. Fantastic art. Uh, one of the Absolutely just so beautiful over there. Great signature too. I love when the artists take the time and pride with their signatures and have the really good ones. It looks like, you know, two different color signatures as well there. Love the shadowing effect. And it looks like we're going to start out the turn with the way that I think you're going to see most of the turns, turns start out for Josh out here. He's going to go ahead and attack with the Dawnblade. Yeah, Icelander is pretty happy to block with two cards each turn cycle. Uh, block with two cards, play something from Arsenal, Waning Moon, uh, and then be able to sort of have an Arsenal on their own turn. Or on a peak here, uh, it might be relevant in this matchup as, again, Dorinthia doesn't really want to part with her cards if she sort of can avoid it, especially because she can sometimes have these fairly red, dense hands. So Dawnblade for three, there's a ton of directions you can go here. Josh has multiple ways of either adding more damage here, giving it go again, uh, or other similar effects. So I think the Quicksilver was used here in a suboptimal situation because Josh cannot draw a card off this. There was no block from hand for Viet, but hey, giving Dawnblade go again for free, not the worst, but Josh definitely was hoping to see some blocks. Now, is that something Josh is going to have to do in this matchup since the timing of stuff's going to be a little weird from Viet Fam? You know, he might not block in some situations. Is he going to have to just make the most of his cards and not always get full value? Again, there are some cards for Dorinthia that allow you to get go again. Um that can give you other benefits on a non-blocked attack, like run through. It says your current attack gets go again, your next attack gets plus two, which is like a, a blowout if your opponent doesn't block you, because then they're dealing with like five damage coming their way. So we have a hit here. So Josh activates Brave Forge Braces, giving Dawnblade plus one, meaning that if Viet wants to deny a counter, he has to block four in this next attack. So sort of tempting your opponent into giving potentially two cards or some equipment here, Brave Forge Braces, uh, really annoying uh, to deal with if you want to keep Dorinthia from scaling that Dawnblade. Absolutely. So let's see how Viet Fam's going to approach us again. Like you said, that Dawnblade coming in for four here. Is Viet Fam finally going to give some cards from hand to block? There's two cards left over in Josh's hand, so still got to uh, worry about some of that stuff that you were talking about here. Still possible reprises, uh, effects, anything like that out of his hand. Now, I've got to wonder, in this kind of matchup, since it is a race and they're going back and forth so much, how much Viet's just going to let some of the damage go through and what damage you're you're like, you know, is the first attack the one you're worried about? Is the second attack the one you're more worried about? Where do you block? Because Viet does actually, at a lot of points in time, want his life totally to be lower than yep. Josh's. So you are incentivized to take some damage, you know, to make cards uh, in your deck better, like Scar for Scar and Wounded Bull and find those, uh Fighting Spirit. So I think that's where you find the really good Icelander players make their, make their money, you know, really do best in these matchups because... They have to find that right spot of and walk that tightrope of taking the right amount of damage. God, I love being Dorinthia and making my opponent do this. Going into the tank on a Dawnblade yeah. swing for four is something it's that... It's the worst. Uh, yeah, I've so been on the other side of this. I've been on the other side of this so many times, Uber, and I hate it. Every time yeah. I hate it. Generally, like, it's correct not to block a, Dawn, a naked Dawnblade for three and then block two cards here is fine. This does open VFM up to a plus three pump effect. So uh, that makes me wonder if he's banking on a defense reaction. Uh, in Arsenal here. Uh, there's definitely a pump here. So Iron Song Response is going to give us plus three. This is a seven damage Dawnblade coming in, threatening a counter. This will generally require Viet. Ah, he does not I mean, have the deal react. So this is, is huge. Be a hit. This is huge. So Dawnblade coming in for seven, right? Presumably, let's assume every hand Dory has a plus three, is very strong because it forces three cards out of an Icelander's hand or some equipment, which means they can't really crack back at you on the other turn. Viet, see, Viet has to keep two cards to sort of do stuff here if he wants to. I thought he might keep a full grip and do something ridiculous like Scar for a Scar into, you know, something else. But it's just going to be an Enlightened Strike here with that card remaining in Arsenal. So this is probably just, yeah, seven. Yeah, this is going to attack for seven. Now that counter does is going to stay on the Dawnblade now. We're going back over to Viet Fam. And he is going to be attacking for seven here. 
Uh, that life total of his is lower than his opponents, but nothing to really trigger that yet this turn. Like you said, that Arsenal card, or card going into Arsenal, still waiting for him. I think he's about to say, yeah, he's still got a card left in his hand. That one's going to be set up in the Arsenal at the end here. So nice, easy attack back from Viet Fan for yeah. a large chunk. But, you know, that last turn was set up exactly how you said. There was that plus three effect to get that Dawn Blade pumped up for the next turn as well. And so it's going to create even more of a problem here for Viet Fan. So it's not just about what he's got coming back. Now he's got to be even more worried about what Josh Lau's next turn is going to look like. So Josh is planning that turn. If he has dead cards in his hand, he he may proffer a block here. But I don't like going into an Icelander, into my turn with Icelander having an Arsenal card with like a three card hand. Because if there are tax effects, my hand, my turn, turn can get shrunk really quickly. There's actually no reason for Josh not to just give his armor. I know that sounds really strange, but in this matchup, you know that your opponent, their physical attacks do not have on-hit effects. None of these Icelander attack actions can, you know, like you need to like stop like a disruptive, you know, there's no effect. snatch there's, or anything like that. Unless there's CNC, here, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So Josh gives two cards here. Glistening Steel Blade is actually pretty powerful when you have a counter on your Dawnblade because it's asking for two cards off the bat here. But he's happy to try and preserve life total a little bit for the time being. Makes me wonder if he has some redundancy in his hand, and that's why he's chosen to, to give up two cards here. Yeah, we'll have to see. We're going back over to Josh. I'll still get that life lead at 34 to 32. If you had fam, though, I think he's pretty comfortable if the life totals stay close with him just having a slight bit of a disadvantage. So like I said, just keeping those cards as good as possible. And okay. speaking of big attacks here, here's the card that you were talking about. Command and Conquer, really a good one in, against almost every hero in the game when they have an arsenal, <sighs> but uh, Icelander plays around this pretty well. Yeah, so this card for Veer, he did just pocket this card. Now, generally, I don't love this because often your Icelander player will just be, you know, uh, provoked into playing that Arsenal card out, like you've sort of said. But V wants to protect this. So this is actually pretty effective for Josh. What is a little, makes me a little quizzical is that he gives up his Dawnblade counter in order to to sort of pull this turn off. Um, now this makes I did me... this the other night, but I had a pummel for the CNC, and that's why I was willing to give up the Dawnblade counter. So normally you want to sure. use that Dawnblade counter to, to, to force cards out of hand. But a CNC for six, getting two cards from Viet Fam actually achieves the same purpose as like a Dawnblade for four. And when you see that block from Viet, it makes me wonder what's setting up in the in the arsenal. And maybe this is why the Command of Conquerors are maybe just a tiny bit better than we assume they can be. Because a lot of the times when you're down in life and you know the way the turns are going to play out here, you can pocket something like a Wounded Bull or a Scar for Scar here and have it kind of set up and ready to go. And this looks like there's going to be an activation of Coronet Peak from Viet Fam here. It does mean that there's, yeah, probably there's nothing to follow this. This is his entire action point on his turn. But again, Josh is thinking, okay, my opponent's protected their arsenal. They can't, they haven't forced any damage towards right. me on this turn cycle, which is quite promising. I think Viet Fan played nothing from Arsenal, no waning moon on that last turn. Josh has to play off three cards and an arsenal, which is very doable, especially if he can start off a turn with a Warrior's Valor or something similar. But he has to think about this. He really has to plan and he has to play around fact that Viet is protecting his arsenal, it must not be a blue card. Right. Uh, but it also is probably not a big attack. Otherwise, Viet probably would have deployed that instead of Coronet Peaking. It may be, I, I'm trying to figure it out. Maybe it's a blue card, like something like Aether Ice. Man, he just didn't have Ice Fusion maybe for it. But like, right. you know, I'm trying to think of something along those lines. Like he's looking for a better spot to get this card in. Because I've seen Viet be very, very patient in spots where, you know, I feel like some players might, you know, just kind of, you know, push a little too hard or kind of, you know, spew some stuff here. And like, you can sometimes give yourself a turn or two to breathe and not have to, you know, throw everything you've got every single turn. So maybe if you're just trying to time something a little better here, because I'm very interested to see what's in this arsenal now, the way these last couple turns have played out. It. it looks like, go ahead. Yeah, I called it. So, I mean, he's happy to go for three cards if he can open with the Warrior's Valor, right? It's a very mm -hmm. sort of cost-efficient way because it has the plus three built in right. and the condition will go again if you, your opponent doesn't block. This is way better with a counter on your Dawnblade, by the way. And this does force out the channel like Frigid. Now, Josh opts not to float his Tunic counter in response to this. So he's happy for a channel like Frigid to come down and there's a Frostbite. So this, this Dawnblade attack costs three. Three yeah. to swing with the Dawnblade, which is pretty frustrating. And Viet Pham probably knows he can put two cards in front and be done with it. Like, it depends what Josh has got sat in Arsenal here, but a good way to shut a turn down here in Josh's. I got to uh, say, this, yeah. Yeah, th this is why we saw the Arsenal stay the way it did. You, do, you don't want to play Channel like Fridge on your own turn because then you're going to have to get, do the condition at the end of turn and pay that kind of that tax on your own card here. But oh. in response to a, a warrior, I was to say, in response to this card here, Channel Frigid, much more impactful than any other time he's had a chance to play it in this game. 
How interesting. So Josh has a pretty blue dense hand here. He had three blues because he opted to uh, pitch away his heart of final to the coronet peak effect. Again, it feels better to have lots of blues coming into a turn cycle that features uh, channel uh, like frigid. So Josh should be feeling pretty good about this. There's still a couple problems. Uh, Viet Fam, if he offers a two card block here, Josh has to find a way to go over. It's going to cost him one for like a, an iron song response. Uh, it's going to cost him two for a lot of his other one for threes. And that would mean he probably doesn't have the resources to swing again. So, uh, you know, Josh might have to just give up on the idea of getting a second Dawnblade attack here, but he needs to pressure Viet Fam. And Warriors Valor is one of the best cards in Dorinthia to pressure anybody. Yeah, now that, along with the Dawnblade, is attacking for six here. Viet Fam thinking about blocking. Looks like he's going to bring the gauntlet out here. Use that floating resource to block for two. And what else do we have uh, from Viet Fam here? Josh Lau, two resources floating. It looks like we're going to have a D-reactor and have a sink below. That's going to soak up all six of it. Importantly, it also means that reprise isn't turned on. So a lot of Josh's pumps are sort of useless in that case. It's interesting. I think like Viet can block with two cards knowing that Josh can only either pump or attack again there. Uh, so makes a decent investment, but again, he has a de defense reaction that he wants to sort of make some use of there, if I'm not mistaken. So the D-React was from hand, excuse me. So uh, in fairness, would have turned on reprise, but expensive turn for Josh to fight through, and he'll have to be happy with that. Uh, back over to Viet Fam here. It looks like he is going to pitch a channel like for here to activate the Coronet Peak. It's going to tax Josh's hand yet again, so a lot of taxing effects here. Uh, either going to get a card out of his hand for discard or to have to, you know, pay for some resources. Either way, going to get a card here. Yeah. That coupled with channel like Frigid is going to make the next turn for Josh Lyle kind of di difficult again. He's going to be in that same situation yeah. that he was in last turn that you were talking about where, you know, he's trying to do multiple things. He's trying to attack with a Dawn Blade, play something onto it, and then attack again. And this kind of play from VFM is really taking that option away from him. I think the best that Josh can hope for is chipping damage on his next turn. Going wide, getting multiple uh, hits with Dawnblade is probably out of the question now. Uh, but I think Josh has to feel good about this because quite often Icelander will use this disruption phase to just start throwing big damage at you. The, the thing I hate most is seeing a channel like Frigid and then like a Wounded Bull having to block that. And then if I block with two cards, right? And I'm trying to play Dawnblade into channel like Frigid, I just don't really have a turn. Like there's nothing yeah, you get one thing about it. Yeah, you might get one thing with that kind of turn happening. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, with the Warrior, you want to tr traditionally be doing two to three things a turn if you can, and maybe have that extra card, you know, go into a block or into an arsenal later. But that's not really been uh, an option for Josh. So I look oh, at this, we're going to have to pitch two cards here to do something this turn. It looks like it's going to be two cards to attack with a Dawnblade. This is not the kind of price you want to be paying for this stuff, Uber. Yeah, I mean, again, at this point, Josh is priced into just chipping away. Uh, what is probably a positive for the Dorinthia play here is that Iceland is not returning any damage. Viet is spending his turns coronet peaking Josh, which again doesn't drain cards from Josh's deck because he's just pitching most of these cards away. Uh, and Viet isn't sort of, you know, that, that's kind of the extent of his disruption. Viet is, you know, using a channel like Fridge and then just blocking uh, from hand a lot of the time. Now, Josh's options are pretty limited here. He wants to chip damage, so any strike to block, he might pay one for like a, a response or, you know, yeah, but getting getting a card out of hand is fine. This is a little scarier. Leaving Iceland with a three card hand means that there's quite a lot of options. There's like a fusion uh, option here. It's just an ice bolt coming out. So three arcane. Again, this is using Fiat's action point. So not super disruptive, just damage here. Yeah, but this is finally going to get some damage through. You know, I was kind of promised a race here from you talking about this match, and it was going to be fast and furious. And these last couple yeah. turns have been anything but that. They've been very, very simple. But that's what Channel Lake Frigid does to the game now. Uh, Ice Bolt is going to start off the turn here for Viet Fam. Got some you resources know, floating here a little bit too. So maybe a waning moon coming in behind this. We'll see. I get the impression that Josh is maybe not invested in racing because he t opted to lose a Dawnblade counter to deploy a Command and Conquer. Mm -hmm. That to me made it think like he was happy, like almost playing like a. A, a large attack reaction style when he can afford to do that and just ask for two cards. Um, it is, it's, I thought he'd try and, you know, sort of put some pressure down and force the three cards out of Viet's hand, but I, I'd, I'd have to ask him sort of what he's thinking of here. Normally, Doreen, it's, so if you want to play a slow game into Icelander, you actually bring in a, a weapon from Dynasty called Jubil Spellbane uh, because it gives you, it's like, a, it's like a three damage weapon, similar to Dawnblade, but it doesn't gain counters from hitting twice. It does create a Spellbane Aegis token, though, when you hit which will block one arcane damage coming in, it's like a spectral Ooh. shield for arcane, essentially. Here's the pummel. Uh, Josh pitching here to this damage from Ice Bolt. Uh, so this definitely tells me he's playing a longer game. 
You might just eat this sometimes if uh, you want to keep a full hand, especially with channel like Frigid still being in play because there's two ice cards in pitch. Now, if you're Josh Lau and you're, you know, uh, coming into this match, knowing you're going up against a VFM in, in this, you know, this ice hunter deck that can tax you, is this kind of the idea that you have ahead of time that, yeah, the game might go longer. You know, there's going to be turns where Channel Lake Fridge is going to be in play for multiple turns or it's going to happen during my turn. So I need to keep myself a little more flexible than just trying to go all in every turn and be able to play these longer games. Yeah, Josh wants to force cards uh, at this point, right? So he knows we, he has no choice. He, he cannot go fast when there's a, a Channel Lake Fridge in play. And Viet's demonstrated his interest in keeping that around by using the action point on his own turn to get a nice card into pitch and then waning mooning on his own turn obviously getting only two damage instead of three to do that requires Viet to keep uh, you know a, a number of cards here so he really sort of favors the disruption that channel like frigid can cause which i think is fine it's especially good if you know you're also forcing a card out of your opponent's hand so you have disruption via like the taxing effects and then asking for cards with arcane barrier and Josh, the fact that he's willing to pitch a blue to that means he knew that Viet was looking to try and get a waning moon that turn and get another ice card in Arsenal. So he probably expected uh, Channel Lake Frigid to hang around for quite some time. Yeah, and it was a really good turn for Viet Fam there too. You see he sets up an Arsenal, is back up to four cards, still has the Channel Lake Fridge in here. So going to have a lot of ramifications for the next couple turns. This is a spoils of war to start off the turn here for Josh, a really impactful card sometimes in this Warriors list. Yeah, I mean, it's great because it gives you unconditional go again. Unlike Warrior's Valor, Spores of War says you get go again, regardless of whether you hit or not. It actually, like, it enables, like, Twinning Blade, for example, that allows you to attack again, um, sort of whether you hit or not. It also allows you to follow up a Dawnblade attack with an attack action if that Dawnblade doesn't hit. So uh, there's a lot of fun lines you can take with that card. Definitely the best card that a Warrior could have asked for in Crucible. Uh, really, really very powerful and... Uh, really important to get non-conditional go again. There are not many cards that can do that for you. Spoils is the best because it comes with a nice little pump. It only costs one. Oh boy, we've got one of my favorite plays here against decks like this. This looks like a ha! brain freeze. What red? Yeah. What red, Vit? <laughs> and brain freeze would have been able to take a red card out of Josh's all hand when if you take a look at his deck list, which is most of them, but good for Josh Lau here. There are no red cards left in his hand to be taken by that brain freeze. Yeah, so... I'm a little unsure what Josh is... Okay, so Josh has to pitch the singing. singing. Viet knows that there was no chance of uh, singing Steel Blade there anyway because of Josh's sort of resource situation. Josh has to pitch the singing to attack once. Yeah, uh, that means... Attack for five from Dawnblade because it's getting pumped by the Spoils of War. Yeah, Viet knows full well that they're very unlikely there's going to be another attack here from the Dawnblade as that will cost two with Channel Lake Frigid in play. So Josh again is saying, give me some cards or I'm going to chip some damage. Yep, and that seems like it's been the plan this entire game. You've been kind of alluding to that, and that's what Josh has been trying to do. So, Viet taking his time, he's going to really map out his next turn. You know, he doesn't have any more cards in the arsenal, so this is this is it for him this turn. But, you know, what's he want to do in his own turn with that action point as well? Maybe he'll throw some damage back at Josh Lau. So let's see how he wants to block. Does he want to give up two cards here? Does he want to give up one? It looks like it's just going to be the Frost Hex. Yeah. Beautiful um, Frost Hex, by the way. Yeah, I love that, that, that cold foil. My Icelander deck's weird because I've got one in rainbow foil, one in cold foil, one in non foil. It's like I'd never be allowed to play that. At all. <laughs> but yeah. So. Hey, you're just trying to keep track of your pitch deck, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's super, super, uh, super legit gameplay there. Yep. So again, Josh gets to chip the damage. And, uh, you know, Viet Femme doesn't go lower in life, which might be something that has implications, but he keeps three cards. It looks like we are going to get a card from him. This is a wounded bull. So none of the extra effects here. This is just a good old seven for three. Plus, they doing their best uh, other ice hero impersonation and doing kind of the oldham attack here. Here's a seven for three thrown in. Yeah. Again, you know, Josh, I, he has less armor in a matchup like this because, uh, you know, obviously he has the final spring tunic as opposed to the courage of blade hold at the equipment slot. But he still has three equipment block, four if you use Brave Forge, you know, obviously twice. Uh, he knows that Channel Lake Frigid's going bye bye. So that's nice. He can sort of try and plan around that uh, a little bit more here. But this is the first time that Viet's extended into, you know, like a fairly hefty attack. Or not the first time, but rather uh, one of the few times this game. And this sort of makes Josh go, right, well, can I win this turn cycle? What kind of disruption can I expect on my turn from Viet? Because if I keep four cards here, is there, do I have the potential to actually generate some threat? Or do I need to just behave myself uh, and, and throw a couple of cards in front here? So Josh needs yeah, to decide that. 
Yeah, because this is going to be one of his first turns in a while without a channel like Frigid up as well. And he knows that's coming. You know, there is one ice card in the pitch zone here, but I don't think we're going to be able to get two more if you're Viet Fam. So uh, fi finally for Josh Lau, he's going to be able to, you know, pay retail for some of his stuff on the next turn. So maybe looking to finally have a good turn. So this is a big spot for him. You know, he's getting attacked for a lot here. So every card he gives up is worth a ton on the next turn. These blocks maybe a little bit harder since he's not, you know, so uh, resource choked. Yep. There we go. Block, block. Block three here from your armor. And this is quite often what Dorinthia finds that she has to do in this matchup uh, is keep cards so you can actually force Iceland to part with, to part with her own. Now, again, if Josh plays a non-attack action before coming in, like Spoils, Warriors, Valor, that's the window for Viet to respond, right? Josh comes in for three naked. Viet might just ignore it and go on with his life. And then Josh has to find a way to give his Dawn Blade go again. So that's what's going to be the case here. Viet obviously putting a card in front, um, you know, would open him up to reprise effects. And of course, a defense reaction from Arsenal would be pretty awful for Josh. <laughs> We're very bad. Yeah, it does look like we're going to go into reaction. It's going to be a glint of the Quicksilver here. <sighs> yeah, I mean, Viet's blocking correctly against Dorinthia. Um, he, there are only two cards in Josh's deck that allow him to sort of get go again in a way that's going to make him feel good without a, that Dawnblade being blocked first. And that's those two run-throughs. So another glint that only gets half of its value. Very annoying for a Dorinthia player, but hey. Dawnblade has a go again. It'll be coming in once more. Yeah, there's another thing like you were talking about earlier. You know, Josh, he can't be too greedy, right? Like, he has to use the cards where they're available here. He can't just hold on to Clint the Quicksilver forever and try to get that reprise effect because, like you said, it's blocking very well in this matchup and playing around that stuff as much as he possibly can. And that begs the question about what the second swing looks like here. Likely a Brave Forge Braces activation for that second swing. If not, it means that Josh is packing... Um, like a, a reprise card that's quite costly uh, and is like, we're talking like route, overpower kind of thing here. No Brave Forge Braces activation. That's very interesting. So he's resource light and wants to make the most of what he has here. It looks like another attack for three here. Still got a resource floating from pitching that blue earlier in the turn. Let's see how Viet wants to handle this attack. I wonder if Viet knows. Uh, if, if you see this, you... Can, you can guess that your opponent is planning to blow you out via multiple reprise effects. Um, I think not seeing that Brave Forge Braces gets turned sideways is a very big tell. I'm curious if Viet Fan can actually read that. Let's see. He's contemplating quite hard on what to do here. He's got to have that in the back of his mind, Uber. This has got to be what's you know take, yeah. making him take his time here. It's like, what reprise cards am I worried about here? Like, what's the worst case scenario? Like, can I just take three? You know, like, mm -hmm. if he just takes three here, he goes to a lower life total, depending on, you know, if he has something like another Wounded Bull or Scar for Scar, might not be the worst thing in the world, but then you got to worry about, you know, if I don't block, like, what's the worst case scenario there, too? I think it's pretty rare that Icelander has a, a, a need to use a four-card hand. Generally speaking, I think that she, um, you know, doesn't want it. So Alpha Blood, one of the few cards that doesn't require reprise to present a pump effect, uh, and Josh is clearing that blue iron song response out of his arsenal, which does nothing in this case. Uh, it, it's been there for a while, Uber. He needed to get that out of there. It's that, been there for yeah. three turns now. You've got, to ask, you've got to try and play off five cards here. So I, I get that. Uh, Alpha Blood again pumps your attack by plus three. Whether or not there's a, there's a block there. So it doesn't require reprise. It's it's a nice card to have if your opponent is is not priced into blocking you. I've got to know why Viet keeps a four card hand here. Because Icelander often feels very good about blocking with two cards a turn cycle. Um, all one at the very least here. Viet was worried about a blowout and I guess denies some value from Josh there. He denies one block, one damage of value uh, as it turns out because Josh doesn't deploy that um, that sort of iron song response. So Lion Strike, now this makes me think go again and maybe Viet Fan yep. can do that. Uh, he can deploy something after this. This is, this is pretty good. Yeah, you were talking about going to this turn. I was about to say this has to be a scar for a scar or enlightened strike to start off this turn with the way that this is being played out and keeping this many cards in hand. This has got to be one of the big turning point turns from Viet Fam. And we don't know what's going to happen behind this, but it's it's not going to be nice for Josh Lau, I'll tell you that. There's going to be an, either another big attack behind this or possibly another spell coming in for a lot of arcane damage and possibly even uh, a waning moon activation behind this as well. So lots of damage coming Josh Lau's way this turn. You know, I thought maybe it was going to be something like Scar for Scar with the uh, the amount of damage Viet took this turn, but it looks like it's just yep. going to be starting out with the Enlightened Strike for five and go again. Yeah, it makes me think that it might be an Insidious Chill that, he, that Viet wants that's to call here. Uh, otherwise, if it's an amulet, he keeps a three-card hand. It could be like Enlightened Strike, hope for a block, so you're still at lower life, 
come in with Scar for a Scar and then deploy Ooh. an amulet. There's like a ton of fun stuff that Viet can do here, but it, we're about to find out either way. So Viet is still low alive. So if he does have another red attack action, then he um he he gets what he wants here. So oh, uh, okay, yeah, that's good call, not cool. the, uh, good call on the insidious chill, but that's gonna get pitched for resources here. It looks like this wounded bull is gonna be coming in for the full eight this time. Uber life total lower on Viet Pham's side, twenty two to twenty five. So he's gonna get that little extra buff on the wounded bull. Hmm. Josh, um, I if he's in, on the game plan of preserving his life total, you probably you might give this two cards. Uh, it really depends on uh, again what he was able to get into his arsenal uh, at the moment. And this, this is, is pretty. It, this is pretty uncommon from Icelander players to be able to do this. Sure, and and this is what makes Icelander so hard to play against. Right, is like the timing of all their stuff. They get to tax you, and then all of a sudden they have a turn like this where they completely turn the game on its head, present you with tons and tons of damage. Where if you take all this, now you're at a super low life total. Because we all we all know once you get down to about the twelve range, oh, you're in the danger oh zone of getting God. killed. It does look like he takes all of it, Uber, down to eighteen. Oh, this is, uh, he's getting around that dangerous number, Uber, that we talk about a lot. You don't want to get much lower than eighteen, or those uh, those boots start to loom heavy on this game. Yeah, it's twelve that you're scared of, right? Twelve is the the threshold where Icelander can potentially get you, uh, unless you have a Oasis respite, which Josh has one in his deck. So here's the Dawnblade for four. You're in living your best life right now. Uh, able to uh, see Viet not block it at all. Viet eventually has to block this. So eventually your patience as a Dorinthia player is rewarded where your opponent will be priced into giving you reprise. Uh, if Viet keeps a full hand here, I mean, uh, if there's no... Okay, so here it is. Run through. This is great. This punishes Viet uh, because Josh now gets that go again and uh, will get extra damage on his next attack. But the sink below is perfect. That's so scary. Josh has to find a way to pump this. Otherwise, this run through is a dead card. This is, uh, again, defense reactions from Arsenal. Absolute blowout for Dorinthia. Josh needs a, an Alpha Blood. He needs a card that doesn't sort of hinge on, on Reprise, and I don't think he has one. So oh, this would be very, huge. very nice from Viet. Yeah, this would be huge for Viet if this just happens to all resolve. Uh, won't have go again here if it doesn't hit. So this run through, like you said, will just do nothing because it pumps your next sword yeah. attack while giving I mean, this one. We'll have go again. Yeah, but oh, because, because be the run through, right, right. Yeah. Unless there's a Twinning Blade in Josh's hand. Yeah, I, uh, I misspoke there. It has go again, but it won't be able to actually attack again. There we go. That's the better that, way. Of that is it. like, I mean, Viet sequenced that perfectly as well. Uh, he waits to see if Josh is going to try. And this is also effective against a Glint the Quicksilver play. Well, let's see, we got an activation of Spring Tunic here. Wait, never mind. Maybe not. Yeah, so looks, like... looks like maybe Josh does have something here. It does look like he. Oh, that's pretty nice. That is really Iron nice. Oh, ride. Yeah, so Einstein Prague obviously is going to put a counter on Dawnblade straight away. And it it goes away, and all of your counters go away if you don't hit. So Einstein Pride's like effect is like basically Dawnblade's effect, is if you don't hit that turn, you don't get counters. Um, going up by plus one here, pretty darn good. If Viet has like another defense reaction, he he loses three value on it. Uh, and Josh has that tunic counter floating here to attack again with Dawnblade. So great situation. It means that Dawnblade comes in for six, uh, which is which is very effective. and. He's threatening to keep both of these counters right now. This is a little scary for our Icelander. Yeah, absolutely. If this gets through, this, this is a huge <laughs> turn. <laughs> for your he's, he's like, hey, what about this? What about this? This is really good, right? Yeah. I love it. Well, again, a new card from Dynasty. Notice it doesn't block. So it's a very interesting card uh, to bring into Dorinthia decks. Josh has three in this list. So I personally prefer to run two. Uh, because again, you can do the shenanigans on, on sort of turn uh, zero if your opponent goes first. So Tunic taken. That's going to allow the John Blade to attack again, it looks like here. This is good. This is pressure. This, as our friend Noah Clark would say, is tempo. Yeah, and this is a big attack here. This is a Dawn Blade attacking for seven. And we've got a four-card hand from Viet Fam here. He did use that arsenal, which gets around reprise and stuff like that. But you got to wonder, how many cards does he need into his next turn? How much can he block here? How much can he be willing to give up? Because this is a large attack. Yeah. He, he can't stop the counters from staying. Is, is the first thing. So uh, that will probably, uh, he probably might take some of the damage from this. I sort of misspoke, sorry. Dawnblade with two counters uh, and Iron Sock Blade. If he gets hit here, Tannen, we go to three counters on the Dawnblade. That is that swinging is, one, four, six. And that is really scary. I've had to face down Dawnblades with more than two counters on them before. I'll tell you this about every game that's ever happened at Uber. I have not won. Yep. Uh, there is a strong chance that you have to take a whole turn off blocking out the Dawnblade, but there are some things that can blow you out if you try to do that. So 
there's no guarantee. And if you get blown, so for example, if you have an attack with Dawnblade, you block with your whole hand. I have go again and Twinning Blade. You cry. You you mm -hmm. you you've lost the game here. So, um, Viet with a very astute play with that defense reaction. Uh, again, there are only so many in the deck. There are only three, uh, and there's only yeah, and that's what Dory folds to. This is why I'm sort of enjoying playing her so much right now. And she she feels really competitive because a lot of decks are not packing a ton of these. We're not in that kind of meta game. The Viet has to go right. Well, if I don't block with three cards, you get a counter. I would suggest that like Coronet Peak's not a terrible block here. Uh, you know, throwing that in the way. I don't know how much Viet, value Viet intends to get from that card for the rest of this game, but Josh is sort of explaining this card. This is what Dorinthia players have to do. We have to explain what our cards do to our opponents uh, much of the time. So I'm surprised so many, Aura. That will stay in play. There's so many double negatives and stuff going on as well. When you're playing against, you're like, well, what's the power of this? Well, well it's this, but if this happens, then, then if this doesn't happen, and there's so much, like, I feel like I need to take notes every time I'm playing against, against the stack. I'm like, so wait, if I don't block this time from my hand, then this happens. But if yep. I block from my hand, then this happens. And this, like, yep. there it's are, the damned if you do, damned if you don't situations. There are actually some hands for Dorinthia that are like that. Whether you block or not, you're screwed. Right. Um, most hands, there is a correct way to play around them. And I think Viet has done that. So I just want to be very clear. I don't think this this situation comes as a result of Viet misplaying. He has unblocked every naked Dawnblade. That's a, that's a tick for me. Because Josh has had to use two glints for no card draw value. But again, uh, run through is designed for this very situation. Uh, back in the day, it used to be either glint or bolters if Dory swung a naked Dawnblade. It was so predictable. You could you could beat her in your sleep. Now she has uh, Blade Flash, a card from the Dorinthia versus Rhino decks, which is gives your attack go again. And also is a blue. A lot of Dorys don't play it because it's only a two block. And then there's Run Through again from the Dorinthia versus Rhino set. Dory actually got some nice cards uh, from the, those dual decks. Sorry, Rhino, I know you didn't. Uh, come out nearly as cleanly here, but I don't blame Viet for thinking. This is a Dorinthia players. We have lots of time, by the way, to check our opponent's graveyards and our own while uh, our opponents get in the tank like this. Well, yeah, it's one of the hardest decks to block against in the game, if not the hardest deck to block against in the game. And, you know, you talk about it so quickly because you've been on the playing end of Dorinthia. And for people at home, if you play against Dorinthia or you want to get better at playing against Dorinthia, I think one of the best ways to do that is actually playing with the hero you know, getting the reps in with the hero yourself, because then you can understand the full range every time they do something. Or like you said, when, when they do certain things or don't do certain things, it kind of telegraphs a tiny bit of what their hand can do. And that can help you out a lot in your matchups because she is getting played a lot more. She's been winning a few pro quests here during this pro quest season. So I expect to see a little bit uptick of Dorinthia. Josh won his pro quest on this list, if I'm not mistaken. So a big shout out to him. Um, it had a had a really strong showing and had to take down multiple Icelander and, and Ultim uh, opponents who are generally considered to be our worst matchups. <clears throat> Again, so yeah, the three cards here from Via, it doesn't feel great because it's not denying counters. Oh, it's denying a counter, I guess. Uh, you know, so he's definitely priced into that, but that means he does nothing on Josh's next turn. So Josh gets another full turn, draw up, swing back around and just kind of uh, try and go hog wild here. So whichever way you slice it, a pretty positive scenario for the Dor Dorinthia player. I think there is zero reason to to block four here for Veard. Uh, first of all, he needs to keep an arsenal. Second of all, Josh is only using the second attack to, to force cards. Uh, the extra Dawnblade counter would be ideal, but a lot of the time, Dorinthia, players want to build counters not in order to get big attacks and feel powerful. They do it in order to get extra cards out of their opponent's hand so they can right. actually keep playing at tempo. Your, your counters equal cards. They don't equal damage most of the time. So it does look like we're going to get a triple block from Viet Fam here. Going to soak up how much is this? It's like seven, I believe. So almost all of it? Or no. All of it? Hypothermia and Insidious Chill are both two blocks. So, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. It is seven. Pardon me. Um, yeah, it's, it's Exaxi's block is is fine. Then the iron oh, on no. response. Oh my goodness. Uh, that stings. Viet loses his hand. Josh gets another counter. Everything you want. And that's a Hypothermia gone, by the way. Uh, not to mention that either Ice Fane also going to the bin, a yellow one, which is annoying for Dory. And uh, yeah, good situation for Josh Ladder being now. He has tempo. He has a lot of threat of this Dawnblade. And even if there are turns where he can't get go again, you know, he will it's be able to protect the counter via his attack reactions. Yeah, and it's still a huge amount. So everybody at home, that was uh, that was an Iron Song response. Since it was defended from hand for VFM, it got to be able to give the, the weapon plus three, get over, get that hit. 
get that damage in and get that counter. So now it's at three counters, and that is super dangerous. I mean, yeah, and if those are three blocks for Viet, right, he would have been just just fine. He's able to block nine there. Uh, so, oh, no, yeah, it, was still, it was still would have been into seven. So, yeah, it still would have been over either way, regardless if he had had the extra block in hand. So he draws out, can't do anything on his turn. Uh, Josh Lau playing off an arsenal here, but you feel pretty good if you can get value out of as many of your attack reactions as possible in a matchup like this. There's a bunch of stuff that's very threatening here. Warrior's Valor is is so scary. This is also a great play to make if you have a lot of Dawnblade counters. Steelblade Supremacy is going to yep. give you cards on every hit. Yes, everybody at home, it's until end of turn, target weapon gains plus two, and whenever this weapon hits, draw a card. And that's until end of turn, so that's going to be for every attack here of this Dawnblade. So this is one of the scary cards out of Dory, the ones that do stuff for the entire turn, because that Dawnblade generally doesn't attack just once. This is asking for probably a full block. This is probably asking for Viet's entire hand. Um, this and, you can is, see, you know, and you can see why Josh was so okay with giving up his entire hand last turn, foregoing that arsenal, because it puts him in this kind of situation where like, I feel like he has all the tempo in the game right now. Because he got away of almost Viet's entire hand. He had to arsenal up, pass back. And now he's got all the tempo. He's the one asking all the questions. The first time, it's putting Viet in the spot where Viet needs to make huge hard blocks to make to get himself back in the game but he also has to find ways not just to not die but he has to find a way to win this game from here and turn it back around in his favor and that's a lot to ask while you're also getting attacked by this gigantic yep. dong blade if viet three blocks this the three cards from hand he gets blown out by any plus three pump from josh um this is also the kind of term where you can expect to see refraction bolt bolters activated uh if josh lands a hit obviously refraction bolters say uh, if you have hit, when you hit, so it's not an attack reaction, when you hit, you can destroy that to give your sword attack go again. This is risky business here. Uh, that are two block and two three blocks. So this is, okay, this is an eight block. Yeah, How so interesting. It's like a triple block from Viet here, but. It's an eight block. So it's exaxes, which is, uh, I mean, Josh, so Josh only gets blown out here if he doesn't have an attack reaction. And lo and behold, there's the puncture. Going up by three, we're at 11 now. So we're getting our hit, we're getting our card, uh, we're protecting our counters, unless Viet Fam has a defense reaction here. Yeah, this one gives plus three. The rest of the card doesn't matter. It's not being blocked by a armor here, so it's not going to puncture into the equipment. But this does give that plus three, like you said. Let's see if Viet has anything left. Still has that arsenal, still has a card left over in hand. This is starting oh, to look dire for Viet Fam here. Looks now you like understand why I said this, this has to be the whole hand from Viet Fam. Right. Like, you just have to overblock here in the situation against this kind of just, attack? Just, just take a turn off. All right. It looks like the draw is going to happen for Josh Lau here, too. It does look like we're going to get the, the Bolton. Uh, that means, sorry, the, the Bracers. So it's going to have go again here. Ah, uh, I love that. It's a hypothermia. Yeah. Really nice. Great response from Viet. Comes in and says, obviously, uh, you know, attacks can't gain go again if they don't have them naturally. So this is after the resolution of that first hit. Josh does get a card, but he's in a weird spot where he's lost his bolters. Um, but again, he's forced he's forced a lot away from from Viet Fam, so doesn't it feel terrible now? Uh, it's a frostbite too. That's that's nothing to shake a stick at as well. Josh can't pay through it. He can't really do anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Right. And again, there's there's no incentive to pay through it because there's no frost taxes in play. Uh, so Josh lets that lie. He will get to keep his counters though. Viet Pham protected himself from getting completely and utterly blown to smith smithereens on that turn. But yeah, it doesn't stop say, Josh from having full tempo and three counters. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that could have gone way worse. That was like one of the better ways Viet could have gotten out of that turn with the kind of hand that he had. Now, this does mean that he doesn't get a turn yet again, but he does get to Arsenal. So he's going into Josh Lau's turn here with an Arsenal and four cards. So if Josh Lau doesn't have another one of those crazy, crazy turns, maybe Viet can get back in this game and turn the tempo around a little bit. We'll see. Life totals at 15, Viet Fam, 18, Josh Lau. This has been a great game, Uber. A lot of back and yeah. forth. A lot of, I mean, there's been so much pressure on both these players to have it in very specific spots, and they've been up to the task almost every time. And Viet sort of makes a fool out of me there because a full block from him, Hypothermia being another two block, wouldn't have been sufficient. So he absolutely right. makes the correct decision again. He got, the, Viet Fam is making a lot of correct decisions here, I feel like, in his blocking, which is impressive considering that we're, we're entering a game state here that you don't see in every right. DMTA matchup. 
really showing off why he was the number one seed going into the top eight of Worlds, really showing you that he is one hell of a flesh and blood player. Listening Steel Blade. That's scary. Uh, it's again, Josh is probably valuing the the go again, the inherent go again that this offers him over the fact that Glistening Steel Blade says every time you hit your opponent, you get a counter. Um, Viet Fan, like, Viet Fan will see this and go, right, well, here is another turn I am probably taking off. Yeah. So, like you said, this does get, make it to where whenever the Dawnblade hits a hero, they get a plus one plus one counter on it. And then you also get uh, your, your next attack. This has go again as well this turn. So, really good way to start off a turn here for Josh Lel. And here we go. This is going to be the first attack from the Dawn Blade. This one coming in for six, it looks like. And this Dawn Blade has been so dangerous this game, Uber. It has really gotten out of control in the last three or four turns. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, correction as well, Viet Fan, that hypothermia came from Arsenal for Viet, not from uh, his hand there. So the discussion about him blocking correctly or not, uh, we, we sort of don't know for sure. Uh, fused Ether Ice Vein here. Some disruption to for Josh, which is annoying because he'll have less of an ability to sort of, you know, go pretty big on this turn. Viet will still have three cards to to block this Stormblade with here. Uh, it means that Josh has like a harder time, I guess, uh, going over uh, and getting value from this Dawnblade hit. This is a tough spot for the Drinthia player. Yeah, taking a look, you know, his his Tunic's only at two counters here because he does have one resource floating. If he had that third counter on Tunic here, it would have been, you know, well time to be able to pay for that Aether Ice Vein possibly and keep the cards in his hand. But this is going to cost him a card either way now. So he can't get around it without giving up a card to Viet Fam. So Viet, you know, clawing his way back into this game in any way that he can and timing his stuff really well. I will say that Viet has played this game very well. He's been blocking very well, and he's been timing his stuff extremely well, which is, I think, the most important thing as an Icelander player is just making sure that you time all of your stuff correctly. Absolutely. Remember, all Viet needs is tempo and a bit more chip damage, and he has Josh in a very dangerous yep. scenario. So make no yep. mistake here. This game is still very much hanging in the balance. Oh, it's super close, because we talk about this. Josh is at 18 and Viet's at 15, but you know we talked about this earlier in the game. If Josh ever gets the life total of 12 or lower... He has to be very, very scared at every point from there because those boots are going to loom so large, just possibly killing you at any point in time when you play cards. If you ever get to where you have no resources or no cards in hand, it could kill you at that moment. Josh has to keep. He obviously wants two resources floating here and not one. Otherwise, he would have paid into that arcane barrier. Most likely, he actually takes all of the damage from either Ice Fane. Yep. And now... So 15 15 now. And Veard has the option still to put probably two cards in front of this. Now, I think that's very dangerous. I think blocking blocking a six-power Dawnblade Xaxes is asking to get blown out. But Veard also says, but if I block three, <laughs> if I block yeah, three, I, yeah, there's, there's, there's not much else sort of uh, to be done here. Again, bear in mind, he's already used his Arsenal card, right? So this is fine. He doesn't need to do anything on his turn at, at all. Uh, not being Ooh. able to pocket a card going back into the next cycle will, will hurt. Well, yeah, it is It is a little scary, too, because, you know, you see the card in hand plus the card in Arsenal and two cards floating. It looks like he's going to get more than all the cards. He's going to get all the cards plus the card at peak here. Yeah, great block. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, if you were just going to try to activate Waning Moon here, get Josh to 12, and maybe try to win the game from here. But it looks like Viet's going to be blocking here and trying to play a longer game. Yep, so Josh, uh, the 10 block is great. You only really lose to Route there uh, and Red Overpower. But Josh has natural go again. So he gets to actually get value out of this Command and Conquer, six damage, but he does lose all of his Dawnblade counters. Very important. Yeah, the one huge, thing benefiting him here is that Viet gave up his Coronet Peak and his entire hand. So no Arsenal on this turn cycle for the Icelander. Essentially, it's only Storm Striders that Viet can use to interact with Josh on this turn. There is a chance for Dory to keep pushing. But this is the dud. if this is a dud hand for Josh, then we're going to have a very interesting yeah. next couple of turns. Exactly. Down to nine. No arsenal card here. Slowly losing that equipment. You know, he's only down to his boots and his, uh, his spring tunic left. Josh working with an arsenal and a full hand here, but that Dawnblade has no counters on it, Uber. So not as big of a threat as it was, but that life totals in single digits. So every point really, really counting right now for Viet Fancy. Just crazy, crazy close game here. So a naked Dawnblade swing might have to be blocked by Viet Fam. The reason is is that there's there's a world where Josh has like multiple three pumps in a in yeah a that's just full of three pumps right like you know yep. I'm looking at it and I'm like most of these pump for threes so that's really scary if you if you know block you know you've got to you got to be a little puckered up and worried that you might just die so this is what this is where Dory needs to get their opponent in a position where they must block um 
and and give those reprise triggers. Josh knows that the, the degree of disruption Viet can deploy in this turn is very limited unless he wants to, you know, potentially use his Storm Striders to deny himself that sort of back-to-back -back turn blowout potential here. So by no means is this a comfortable turn for our Icelander player. Josh is on three tunic counters right now. Uh, there's like a few uses for that. Sometimes what you want to do is like swing a naked dawn blade with that tunic counter to give minimum information. Josh has a form of go again. This is a hit and run redundant card from the previous turn. So he has unconditional go again. So he's going to come in for three and see what he can make of it. Yep. Starting off with a hit and run. Like you said, your next weapon attack this turn gets go again. It's an interesting card because uh, it also helps to, it will also pump your next attack if you've already attacked that turn. It gets much more use in Kasai decks in Blitz, but there are like some corner cases where, you know, you can hit and run after hitting your first attack if you already have go again and take your Dawnblade up to a break point uh, with, with hit and run there. So you actually can get value out of this play. I really like the modality of this card. Uh, a lot of people sort of took a while to figure it out. I actually like red hit and run for for that reason. Extra sources of go again in a meta that has Dramai, for example, it, is really important. Six so block here, pretty reasonable, block. but yes, yeah, so a few things you can blow out. Singing Steel Blade into a three pump uh, is a blowout. So there's a couple things that uh, can be scary, but Viet wants to try and wrestle tempo back Tan, and he wants to try and keep two. It's fair. Yeah, and he's, he's having to try to do that, right? Like, he's just hoping and praying here that this is enough to slow down this turn or to keep it manageable and then maybe get into his turn with at least one card left over so he can set up an arsenal because that's what he's looking for here. He's looking for that pivot turn where he's not dead, right, obviously, but he gets a card in his arsenal. Maybe he can do something during Josh Lau's turn, get a little bit of damage in. He doesn't need much. He only needs to get about three damage in here, and then he could possibly cobble together a win from this. So Josh is doing everything he can in the situation to force cards out of Viet's hand to where it never gets into that case, into that scenario. Let's see, does Josh have something to, to add to this? There are like there are three or more cards that are very good for Josh here. Twinning Blade will allow him just to attack again. Viet basically loses those two cards. Singing Steel Blade lets him go by plus one. Get an attack reaction from his deck. Yeah, we haven't seen a twinning blade from him yet this game, right? Either. So he if they're in the deck, there's yeah. Oh, he pitched one early. Okay. We're going to so six. this looks like is that a puncture? Yeah. So it, look, it looks like we're gonna get a plus three on the dawn blade here. There's always more. There's always more tannin. But, but but wait. Oh, this here we go again. Aura coming in. And this is gonna so, give a counter to the dawn blade. So this is gonna get it over that that block. Yeah. Ideal circumstances now. Josh also doesn't have to spend a resource on Brave Forge Braces to be hitting for a breakpoint on his next Dawnblade attack. Now, Viet, uh, okay, the Blizzard comes out. Pay two or don't get go again. Tough one here. Josh needs to have a blue in hand to keep this turn going. And let's see if he does. Is, VFM is going to take a damage here down to eight, but this is going to stop the turn in his tracks, and it looks like it is, and that's going to give Viet Fam a card left over in his hand. Uber, this is one of the better case scenarios for Viet Fam here, getting a decent block getting to slow down Josh just enough and getting to pocket a card into his arsenal going into Josh's turn. This is the beginning of a turnaround from him, but oh. some stuff really needs to work out for him here, though. No guarantees, right? We right. have a Dawnblade counter. We have a five-card hand from Josh. Uh, the fact that Viet Fam, you're right, gets to deploy and develop an arsenal means that he has some disruption available to him. This game. Yeah. He, he was able to disrupt Josh without an arsenal card last turn because he fortuitously had a Blizzard, which comes at an instant speed, right? That's pretty sick that's pretty perfect for when you don't have an arsenal uh, right so i'm not salty at all by the way just saying uh pretty pretty great situation <laughs> for view here coming in for four though doesn't suck again it's still asking for cards it's still risking turning on reprise yep and that's going to be the hard spot for Viet him Viet fam here this turn is how does he block how does he prevent this you know he's at eight this is an attack for four it's really scary to just take this because you might die, like you said, but then if you start blocking from hand, you're turning on all the reprise cards, and this is a five-card hand from Josh Lau with that arsenal sitting there. So this is going to be very, very difficult for Viet Fam to come through here. But for a feather in his cap, if he's able to make it out of this turn and get any forward momentum, maybe he has a chance to steal this one back from Josh. We have to see. This is a tight game. This is getting really close, and this has been one hell of a game. Uber. Oh, yeah. Absolute banger. Both these players really understand their outs uh, and generally looks like they have a really good understanding of like things that they sort of need to be looking out for. Viet has only played one Channel Lake Frigid. He's only played uh, one Hypothermia, one Blizzard. Uh, that says a lot. Uh, it means that the Icelander player is struggling to really put pressure down here. Josh is counting his guys doing this for our fan. Viet's like, can I see your uh, great he, must, he must know that I'm, I, I was going to cast this game, I think. So,
crucially, um, what he's trying to make sure, he, if he's going to use a singing steel blade here, he needs to know what's in his deck before he goes looking, uh, essentially. You don't want to pick up your deck and just goldfish for a bit. Looks like all three Iron Song. Looks like there is a, a glint there. Now, let's see, he is... Hey, he's going to go ahead and count out the... Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to see if there any of these cards are left over so everybody has all the information here. This could be Viet asking. Uh, what that's that's what I think is actually happening. I think yeah. Viet's like, hey, so, can you like show me? Just to be clear, um, you, in Flesh and Blood, you cannot reorder your opponent's graveyard. Uh, that is actually against the rules. But what Josh is doing is responding to a question from Viet saying, hey, like, what is the contents of your... Because we're playing via webcam here... Yeah, Viet can't really reach across, can he? Here, you know? No, that's right. So Josh is, you know, obviously being very polite here and sort of saying, hey, like, this is what... Because Viet fam knows he's potentially walking headlong into a singing steel blade. He wants to know what the density of attack reactions is in Josh's deck. And go bad news for you, Viet. There are still quite a few of them remaining. We've seen zero Almost routes. Like Red overpowers are there. I think we have uh, an Alpha Blight, an Iron Song response, a Glint. We've got at least two uh, Singing Steel Blades, if not more. Uh, yeah, it's almost like the deck's full of them. Yeah. So, so a really you, scary man. spot for Viet, him. Viet Fam here. Definitely uh, understanding why it's going to take him a little while to get this correct. And we've seen him be up to the task almost every turn in this game of getting the blocks correct or mostly correct from his spot or as correct as he can be from what his hand, you know, is giving him. So... Definitely don't envy his seat right now. I wouldn't want to be there because I don't think I would be able to figure this one out. Yep. Challenging indeed. Uh, I like how you're just like, yep. After I said that, you're like, yep, you would never figure this one out, Tan, and you have zero chance. But not I mean, even, I, not I don't even think I would figure this out. Of the doubt. I don't think so I would I figure this out either. I've played Dorinthia Mirrors, and I've had like my brains fried from playing yeah. The mirror uh, sounds like it's a just a. It's like a the nightmare. Twilight Zone of Flesh and Blood. It's you just don't play the way you that ever kind normally of game. would. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of like trying to like block exact amounts uh, with your equipment, like you know, over blocking by five and weird stuff like that. So Polar Blast here. This is again for Viet Fam replacement level in the Icelander deck. It will inflict a frostbite. It will allow Viet Fam to draw a card. But Josh knows that's a green light. Uh, outside of like again something deployed via Storm Striders, that might be it for disruption from Viet on this turn. And this is another card in the Viet Fam's hand too. So getting a card deeper you know, maybe find something else that he could possibly do here. Look, there's this waning moon activation that is going to get three through. So that's going to put Josh Lau down to 12. Are you worried if you're Josh Lau? You're at 12 and there's four cards left over. I'm taking and this. You. I'm absolutely yeah. taking this. Uh, VFM cannot present 15 damage this turn. He cannot do that. The best he can do is, is another five out of hand uh, via Storm Striders here. So Josh again, fall to that 12 life threshold. So he needs to hope that he can sort of kill Veer on this turn, but Veer gets a lot of value for that one blue he pitched. He not only gets a Frostbite, he draws another card for blocking purposes. He also gets to activate Waning Moon. That's why uh, those one-cost cards from Arsenal uh, fit so snugly. They're so efficient for what Icelander is trying to do here. Man takes it like only Josh Lau can. Yeah, I was about to say, I love this timing from Viet as well. It gives Josh the chance to possibly like, uh, I don't want to say like mess up, but maybe overthink and play maybe too defensively in this spot where he does give you some resources or gives you a card here to like not take some of this damage. And then that card or that resource might be huge. So this is almost like a taxing effect from Viet where Josh gets to decide whether he wants to do that or not. And it looks like he's okay with just taking the full bill. Viet still needs to consider his block here. So he has, <laughs> he's been able to spend some time here setting some things in place. He may have to be looking ahead now at like, how do I actually kill my opponent? Are they just going to grind me down with the amount of tempo they've been able to assemble? That's that's a really valid question, I think, to ask at this point. Yeah, so. it's been in that spot for a few turns, right? Like, he's been trying to pivot, trying to find... Because, like, he, he, number one for him over the last about four or five turns is not die. You know, he's been yeah. getting attacked by giant Dawn Blades, you know, with tons of cards left over. Josh showing him his graveyard again here. And Viet's been doing... He's been up to the task at not dying. The problem is Viet he has is to find... Not... Oh. Sorry, yeah. sorry, I, I interrupted you. Yeah, you know, in you know, Viet's in the spot where he also has to find that pivot, like we've been talking about, where he can, you know, he's got Josh down to twelve here, but if he gives up cards, he's not going to be able to present enough damage back to kill Josh Lau without taking a little more damage, and then he gets to the point where he has to start giving you his whole hand every turn. So he's in one of those really, really tough spots where he's going to have to walk the tightrope, and if he gets it wrong, you know, half a card either way, he's going to lose. Yeah, Viet is not going to find solace in the contents of Josh's graveyard. 
No, absolutely the reality not. Is, is that his threat density is still very high. And with three cards left in hand, a betting man would surmise that a three block would be minimum necessary here to stop this turn from getting out of control. It, you know, we don't know the contents of Viet's hand here, but would, like, if, if you had to just blankly say from his hand, do you think just blocking for three with one <clears> card is, is the way to start here this turn and then see what happens? Or would you be over blocking in this situation or block? You must over block. You must over block. Um, Josh will almost certainly either have a way to go over and protect the counter or give this attack go again. Uh, you must give him three cards, I think. But the problem, here's the problem. When you're attacking for, this is why one counter on Dawnblade is so, so huge. You must give three cards. Minimum. And even then you can lose if you, if your opponent plays like a singing steel blade uh, into like a, 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 you know, like a route or an overpower. Um, so the, Josh has all the options. Uh, Dorinth is very toolboxy in that sense, right? You have the ability to go digging for sort of whatever card you need for that specific situation with Singing Steel Blade. Um, and so that's why like blocking, trying to guess how much your opponent can pump their attack to based on their resource availability is really important. The problem for Veard here is he's looking at three cards from Josh. So Josh can play Singing Steel Blade into literally any attack reaction in his entire deck and have maybe a multiple this turn. So I would consider this turn, despite us having very limited information, to be a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Because if Josh doesn't have Singing Steel Blade, which is entirely possible, there are a myriad of other things that can be very scary. He could just like go tall on this one attack, keep the counter, you know, take Viet even lower. It's probably worst case. Viet just took that four damage and Josh has the run through. Oh no. So that means he gets go again. And then next attack is plus four. If Viet does not have a sink below, he could be in deep trouble. And even if he does have one, it's coming out of hand, which is going to turn on reprise. Worst yeah. case for Icelander. Yeah, two cards left over in hand for Josh Lyle here. He does have that arsenal still, and Viet is in a world of hurt here. Viet's thinking about, I think, a defense reaction from hand here. That's the only reason why he hasn't just taken the damage straight up. Frostbite was paid through there. It's run through, costed two instead of one in this case. Maybe uh, there's maybe like a Blizzard. Blizzard is, is probably what he's hoping for, or like something extremely disruptive from hand. I think either Ice Fane is probably the best, but even then you're definitely getting hit again. You are getting hit again, unless you can turn off go again. Do you think there's a way that Viet can construct a game where he gets out of this and can possibly win from here? Or is this just going to be way too much for him over the next two turns? This run through, seeing this run through, makes me feel like Viet is in, is in deep trouble. If he... So if he had a card in Arsenal, if he had a defense reaction in Arsenal, his odds would be much better. He would say no blocks. He'd wait to see what the Dorinthia does. Okay, run through, pumping up Dawnblade on the next attack and giving it go again now. A sink blow from Arsenal covers up the Dawnblade, also doesn't turn on reprise. Means that Josh has to find a non-reprise dependent attack reaction. Uh, it also means that Singing Steel Blade will not allow him to shoot her. Without reprise, Singing Steel Blade is just a pay one, pump one. Uh, very, very dissatisfied to sort of use in that situation. But even if Viet did that, Josh has that unconditional go again, so he could deploy another attack action. Now there's uh, Pursuit of Knowledge, actually kind of nice in this list. And I think there is a Command and Conquer. These are things that will, will force Viet to part with the contents of his hand. At this life total, Viet has, Viet has called a non-block for the last time this game. He will no longer have the opportunity to do so. That's a really good point. Like, cards we may have to give it up for every single attack here in this game. We, we talk about this a lot in Limited, you know, when you start getting in the, the or it works constructive like the Kodachi lock or the weapon lock, where like, you just have to give up cards to every attack that they have in this game. This is an awful spot to be in when you're in flesh and blood because it's so hard for you to find a way to come back from these spots just because you're, so much of your resources are tied up in blocking. So it looks like Viet going to go ahead and start to make a move. Josh, they're going to have counting up the damage. It looks like he's taking the four. So to so Josh, Josh, to four. Josh seeing this, this reluctance uh, from Viet should be telling him, hey, likely there's a defense react here. He's still going to have to give me cards from hand, though. So let's just jam. Dawnblade comes down. You see there was a, um, a twinning blade there. So even if Viet overblocked, Josh would be able to give Dawnblade go again and go around the block with twinning. So Viet right. actually making probably the better decision there now that we know the rest of what Josh's hand entailed. But this is still scary. 
Yeah, so it looks like this is going to be an attack for six here with a resource floating. Still a card in hand, a card in arsenal for Josh Lau here. Viet does have four cards left in his hand, but he's got to be worried about dying here. This is a lethal attack by an extra two here. So even if you were to block for three here, you could still possibly die. Like you said, you, you feel like there's a defensive reaction here, the way this has been going. And I'm wondering if it's there. If it is, it would be huge this turn. If not, I don't know if Viet's going to be, be able to get well, out of this game. I'll tell you this much. If Viet had triple blocked that Dawnblade attack, he probably would have lost the game on the spot. Because he would have one card left in his hand to block. So two block here. You are blocking Xaxis. Uh, Brain Freeze. Got this nice uh, little feature where it blocks for three. It's pretty nice. Yeah, you know, kind of handy to have. Josh has two cards here. We're going over by three. Viet will go to one here. Yeah, this is an Irish or more. response. That's why he's the go, baby. Shit. Okay, now we're putting 12 damage in front of six. Viet has to have a defense reaction. That's game. It's your boy. Let's and go. There, and there hey. is the fist bump. Viet fam is going to go down here and lose in round one to the warrior himself, Josh Lau. And Uber cannot contain himself. I wish we all could see the video of him as this was going on. Look at him. He is so happy. That's what I'm talking about, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Congratulations to Josh Lau there. And I think we tried, I tried to make this clear as we've gone through this game. Vietfam has made, in my opinion, correct blocking decisions oh, almost yeah. every single time. Um, the way Josh drew up some of these hands, um, some of the situations that he's able to find himself in, really expertly piloted, I think, by both players. A really exciting game. Uh, Josh having two attack reactions there is pretty insane. You're allowing Dorinthia to play off five cards hands because she has that tempo. Again, if you tr if you triple block uh, that first attack, you still lose because Josh has go again and he has twinning blade and he has another attack reaction. So uh, he would have gone over by four there. So really impressive stuff here to both players. And Josh Lau is going to advance in our Goliath Gauntlet. Love to see that. He will go up against the winner now, Chris Ali, the second place, uh, obviously, from the World Championships or his teammate from the card guys, Nathan Crawford. Whichever way you slice the talent, it's going to be an incredible matchup. Absolutely. Got a shout out to Viet Fam, and the guy is such a stone cold killer. What a calculated player there. Really enjoyed his rendition of that Icelander gameplay today. Yeah, I took a couple notes during the game, you know, to talk about afterwards, and it's pretty mm. much exactly what you said. All I said was insanely close match and great blocks from Viet Fam. There's just not much he could do, right? You know, you're in a lot of situations, damned if you do, damned if you don't. There's really no, you know, he found the best block in the situation, but it still wasn't great, you know? And that's what Dorinthia does to you with a lot of these attack reactions and these repri reprise effects is it puts you in situations where you can only find the the best spot for yourself, but it's still not good for you. You know, it's not like you get to, you get to just block out and then, you know, move to your turn and we get to play a normal game of flesh and blood from there on out. In, you're using so much brain power every turn, just trying to stay alive while also trying to do something. And Josh Lau was so good at as soon as he gained tempo in that game, he never let it up for yeah. the rest of the game. And that was just impressive from both sides. From Viet's side, like even getting the game as close as it was, I thought was extremely impressive. I don't think I could have been anywhere near keeping that game that close. And then again, Josh Lau just playing. Like you said, this is why he's the GOAT. This is why he is the warrior stand. And he played this game the absolutely goat! amazing. <laughs> the goat standing. Oh my yeah, goodness. Absolutely. Uh, that's actually going to do it for us today because this match was so long. We're going to be breaking up these two into two days, but we do have some more, another match for you on Sunday, and this is another great one. And that one's going to be Mara versus Bartash Zimba, and that one's going to be a barn burner, I have to believe. I've taken a look at Mara's deck list. It is spicy, and I am super excited to see that one. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm really pumped again whenever we can involve players from europe in our goliath gauntlet we try and take that opportunity bartosz is an incredible player out of poland yep. current national champion a uh, really really impressive individual i'm looking forward to seeing him go ahead ahead mara obviously no slouch herself has also contributed fantastic prizing to this tournament by the way Absolutely. she's 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 an artist over at blackwing studios you can find her uh, over there on twitter and on etsy if i'm not mistaken and uh, her work is sublime she's definitely a dab hand and a bit of fab as well so can't wait for that one tannin uh but i need to i need to uh i need to take some breaths you know i mean i might need to go run through the fields and jump around you need around a cold shower after hills. this match honestly just a nice cold shower i think is what you really need and that's going to be it for us today from the goliath gauntlet thanks to uh, kfave cards for sponsoring us as always just really coming through make sure you check out kfavecarbs.com and 983 media for doing all the work 
behind the scenes and really just make it as easy as possible on you and I, Uber, because let's be real, uh, they're doing the heavy lifting and we're doing the easy stuff. But again, thanks for watching today. Make sure you watch tomorrow's episode. Don't miss out on more. Let's